we did have a, um, a sighting come in in March, May of this year. Um, the person saw on the far outskirts of Christchurch three um, circular disks um, in formation moving across uh, the farmland on the on the eastern western side of uh, Christchurch but there wasn't a lot of other information to it they reported it to civil aviation and got the usual response um, and then we had a historic sighting from 1974 of uh, three women who were tramping in what's called the Orongorongo Gorge which is north of Wellington quite remote and mountainous and um, they saw this massive moon-like uh, golden light that was hazy around the edges, moving slowly down the ridge lines of the mountains, which are around 2,000 feet high. And um, it came to a standstill some distance from them, high up, of course, not close up to them. And uh, they saw this very small, what they described as a star-like white light racing in from the west. And um, it circled around this light and then went up inside, uh, disappeared up underneath it. So that was um, an account from 1973-74, which is very interesting. But last, um, last year, I've been contacted by a guy who had an un unusual sighting last year. He was um, on a farm in a remote area of Northland in the North Island. And he and his friend were going out at the shed to the shed at night after dark, and they saw a large ball of white light approaching. Um, it changed its speed. It changed uh, its its um, trajectory without swooping around like an aircraft. So it was an instant acute turn, um, and it came in closer to where they were on the farm, and uh, then it just proceeded to come down and they thought it was going to land but much to their shock and horror it just went straight down through the like nine foot um, tea tree bushes and straight down into the ground and disappeared so they were in absolute shock and awe of what they'd seen and then they watched it for about another five minutes to see if anything would happen and it would come out of the ground and they said it rose out of the ground so that the the top part of the uh, of the round light was visible and then it disappeared. So they ran into the house because they didn't know what was going on. Um, and they turned all the lights off and um, watched from inside the house. They watched for a couple of hours and didn't see anything. Went to sleep, got up early in the morning, rushed out and had another look, but they never saw it again. So um, he was reluctant to report this because of the nature of the sighting. He thought that we would think he was absolutely crazy. But um, last year, we also had a, a historic report from several years ago from Queenstown down in the South Island, which is a big um, tourist town, lake and snow and skiing and all that sort of thing. And um, one of the ski operators, tourist operators in a, in a remote area north of Queensland saw um, a light coming down, which he thought was a helicopter in distress and he was a volunteer fire brigade member, so he was waiting for it to explode. He was up on, on a mountain hiking and watching it. And um, then he realized it was a circular disc and it went straight into the ground and disappeared without even a, a thud or any visible sign of it having been there. So um, we were able to tell this witness uh, of this other sighting so that he was reassured that we didn't think he was crazy. And there's a lot of sightings worldwide of similar things happening of a craft disappearing into the ground. And that's about all our roundup is. We've had a lot of other sightings, but they were explained by aircraft or lanterns or whatever, you know, reflections, etc. So those are the three main historic and current sightings that we've had. Oh, thanks, Susie. It's good that uh, reports are still coming in, regardless of whether they're, you know, current or historic. And Basically, they're quite timeless anyway. That's right. Yeah. Okay, Ben, you're going to give us a bit of a roundup from your region? Yes. Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, it's great to see everybody here at the meeting. I've sort of, yeah, I mean, like Susie, you know, there's not a lot of new cases that are happening that I would regard as being of any any great substance 
being reported uh, at the moment through to, you know, to UFO groups. And that's why I've been focusing on the stuff from the past when things really were a lot more interesting. And I run a, uh, well, I do two podcasts and one with Cheryl, Strange Encounters Down Under, and also do Unexplained Phenomena Australia, which is an, on an American network, um, the UNX network in America. And on that show, I've been digging deeply into a series of absolutely intriguing events that occurred in the New South Wales town of Kempsey. And uh, I'm not sure if everybody knows where Kempsey is, but it's on the north coast, north coast of New South Wales. Uh, and it's probably, uh, having, done, having looked at this quite extensively, there was an incredible amount of activity uh, occurring in the early 70s and we would all love for it to be happening today but you know for some for whatever reason these events are not happening to this level in uh the 21st century but back in the the 60s the 70s and the 80s and to a lesser extent the 90s that was a really active period uh for for ufos in around the world and here in the southern hemisphere new zealand australia and kempsey seemed to become almost like the focus point, like a central focus point at one point in time in Australia where there was just this huge amount of UFO events occurring. And what was really interesting about it as well was that it was reported in the Maclay Argus, which is, the, which, is, which is or was the local newspaper for the Kempsey region. And what I found so interesting about it is that the newspapers are the history. That's where a lot of these fabulous events have been recorded over time. The newspapers are the history. And I've got a bunch of old records here that I've gone through these old yellowing newspaper articles. And I found a whole bundle of them that were put together that were, that talked about this Kempsey flap or this Kemp, the Kempsey incident. And it was such a wide variety of things that occurred between 1971, 1972, and even into 73, 74, 75, there was still activity, but the real peak was 71, 72. And it all started with the most amazing event that was reported. And I just want to say one more thing about the local newspaper was that they took it seriously. And that was, that was really quite an amazing thing in itself, I think, because the media has a, has a, has a really love hate relationship with the topic of UFOs. But the local papers have, have always tended to be a little bit more um, level-headed when it comes to these, to these reports. And the Argus did many reports at this time, and they did all of them in an absolutely in investigative and level-headed approach. And they really just simply reported the facts of what had happened. And there was no green smoke, no, you know, no silver clad, you know, creatures. Like it was just all done. With a, with a straightforward reporting style. And I really, that really appealed to me as well, the fact that the local newspaper had been able to approach it from that, from that uh, perspective. And I'm sure the local paper must have thought that we're being invaded here. <laughs> like, you know, it was just a hive of activity, um, particularly through April. Now, April is an important month because... Uh, in, in Victoria, that was when the Westall case occurred in 1966, the Burke's Flat Bending Headlights case. Um, so that's, that's had a, an important month, been an important month in UFOs over the years. There'd be lots of other examples of it as well. October's another month where there's a lot of, lot of UFO activity. So I'm, I'm not going to go into the whole thing because I've just done a two, two, two hour episodes on it and I'm heading into my third hour for next week's show. So it's, it's a very involved and multi-layered flap that occurred. Not, and I'm not aware of any other flap out there that, that perhaps matches the Kempsey one. And I even would take that to almost onto a world scale because they had a, a lot of activity. But I'll, I'll share a couple with you. The first, the first, it all started with a real bang. And that's, <laughs> that's what I found it, it appealing about it as well. So they, the Argus had a, had a, came out with a report on the 8th of April, 1971. And it was an incredible event. A man who lived at, now, 
so when I talk about Kempsey, around Kempsey, there's a, there's a whole host of other little areas that you'd never would have heard of. Um, so Colombati to the north and there's Willy Willy off to the west and um, Taruka, uh, Willowarren. There's all these little, they're really only farming communities. But those and there's another area called Crescent Head as well, which is more on the coastal side. There's a town over there as well. And that whole area, so probably a 40 mile sort of a radius around Kempsey was where all of this was occurring as well as, you know, within the, the Kempsey city limits itself. So just the whole district was inundated uh, at that time. And I'd love to see it now, but it's just not happening. So on the 8th of April, 1971, the very first article that the Argus had was a man at Greenhill, and Greenhill is just this tiny little place just to the west of Kempsey. There's probably no more than 20, 30 houses there at the most. And I Google mapped, walked it, trying to find this actual house where this occurred. And I sort of had some success, but, but not that I could say that I found the actual house because 1971 is a long time ago. And a house like that could easily have been bulldozed sometime in the last 50 years. So I did have a look. Now, a man at Greenhill claimed on Friday night that he had been sucked or drawn through a window pane in his kitchen home. Now, that's pretty dramatic. That would get your attention. A guy has been sucked out the window of his kitchen. And his age was, he was 34 years old, and he fell seven feet to the ground outside his home, but was unhurt except for minor cuts on one hand and arm. And the window, the window did break. And the terrified man, he told his wife that he saw a strange, small, saucer-shaped face at the kitchen window. So this little ghostly round face was staring in through the window. And that drop was seven feet from where the kitchen window was down to the ground outside. So this, this window, this face is at the window, this little round white face is looking in through the window. And he got such, he got such a shock that, he, that, he'd, that he'd seen this. And as soon as he saw the face, he was then inverted horizontally and he was sucked out this window. Out, touched straight out this window. And his wife, who was 26, said she heard breaking glass in the kitchen sometime after 10 p.m. and thought that her husband had broken crockery or, and glass and glasses that were drying on the sink. And she ran outside and she saw his legs and hips disappearing horizontally, horizontally through the top half of the bottom window. So she comes into the kitchen as he has horizontally been taken out the uh, taken out the uh, the kitchen window, 1971, Green Hill near Kempsey. So that was quite amazing. Now, there's more to it than that too, because if it was just that one isolated incident, you could say, yeah, well, you know, did that really happen? Did they make it up? But in the whole context of the whole Kempsey saga, it really is a strange occurrence, and it has the it has the backup support of all the other events that happened around it. So the man who, he, he, he remained sort of anonymous um, and he, he vowed that he would never live in the house again because he was absolutely terrified and he went straight to Sydney and he left his wife uh, and kids at the, at the house. And she said that even though she'd prefer not to stay in the house, there was nowhere else for them to live. And she was sleeping under the blankets under the blankets at night with the blankets over her head, and she was scared as well. And she said, "We came home from the neighbours at about ten o'clock after watching television, and her husband went to bed and was playing with the baby. He got up, went to the kitchen to have a drink of water. He didn't turn on the light, but afterwards said he tipped his head back towards the sink and saw this little face pressed up against the window. It had no hair and it looked like a small saucer." And it had features, but he could not really describe the features. He doesn't remember much about going through the window. He says he was sucked out by some force and he fell out onto the bottom of the steps on his back. So he's fallen seven feet down onto his back. And I reckon that would hurt if that happened to you onto wooden steps. And she ran outside and she thought he would be stunned, but he wasn't even winded. He jumped up and he ran like hell down, down to a pile of gravel. And she ran after him and he was crying and shaking. And 
she thought that he had the horrors and she told him that he had he had the horrors and she went back to the house and he asked not to he just could he was just so so frightened by this and she took him to the hospital and he became unruly at the hospital because he, he was so so terrified the police came and they put him in the holding cells uh for that night so it was that was the event that kicked off the whole Kempsey incident. Now, you know, I thought, wow, that's that's an amazing, amazing event. But I sort of thought to myself, well, you know, that that could be a party getting out of hand. Who knows? Or you know, you know, who really knows whether that happened? But on the same night, there were other sightings around Kempsey of strange lights in the sky. So same evening, different locations people reporting strange lights. Now, Kempsey's on the Maclay River and there's this lovely river that flows through that area. And there was, the UFOs were seen like they are often around, around the waterways. So he went through a glass plane that was 30, glass pane, sorry, that was 32 inches wide, 10 inches deep, and he didn't touch anything on the sink in front of him. And the fact that he wasn't hurt is really quite puzzling. So that's one incident that I that I thought that got that got my attention, and it it just went on and on. So the paper reported that, and what I like about it is that the paper reported it in a straightforward manner. That's what they reported. They they didn't embellish that in any way at all. It was just a straight up report, which you think, wow, that's really really extraordinary. And over the next few days through April, right through April, there was all these other reports that came into the into the Argus. And there's reports of crop circles, land, not so landing marks, landing impressions on the ground on various farms that had actually occurred. But one of the other ones I wanted to share with you was three schoolboys in the same month on the 24th of uh, April, 1971. Three schoolboys were at a little place called Columbati, and that's north of Kempsey, and there's nothing there. Like, even when you go there, there's just a railway line and there's a highway that goes through that area. And But there's a little hamlet there, and at the time there was a post office there that probably doesn't exist now. Now, these three schoolboys, they were aged 11, 13, and 9, they sighted a silvery object trailing flames coming over the area where they were. Now, the object came over the top where they were. The boys were terrified. It started to descend. It was circular in shape and it had a row of windows all around the bottom. And all of a sudden, four landing legs came out from the bottom of it and they had these foot pads on the bottom of each of the four extensions. And the object banked off and disappeared and appeared to land down in the gully. And the boys, the boys were extremely terrified and they told their school teacher and he made them sit down and draw it. And they all drew pretty much the same, the same object, uh, what, the, what the three of them had seen, which was really, really interesting. And another report that I really liked was from fishermen. This is also in the same time period around, oh, actually, this is the 24th of April, 1971. So two fishermen were reported seeing strange lights off Crescent Head Beach when they when they went fishing, and they'd driven out uh, right along the coast. They'd parked their car, and they then walked two miles back down the beach with their fishing rods, which I thought was extraordinary in itself. <laughs> Walking two like parking your car where the beach is, you could have just gone fishing where the car was, but they walked two miles down the beach, and. What they saw was they, they saw a strange light out at sea. But what was even more mysterious, they heard this large, loud grinding noise at the same time. And they described it as being like gravel being crushed. And if you've ever heard gravel being crushed, that's a very noisy activity when, when there's gravel being crushed by machinery, as you can imagine. But they described this noise as being 10 times louder than gravel being crushed. And this sound was coming from out, out, out across, the, across the ocean where this object was hovering in the sky. They both promptly picked up their fishing rods and their gear, and they legged it back over the sand dunes, taking a, a bit of a shorter route back to where they had parked their car. 
And as they were as they were going over the sand dunes, they could still hear this massively sound, grinding, crunching sound, and the and the light was still in this, this object was still sitting in the sky. They got back to the car, they hopped in the car, turned on the key. They could still hear the sound, and they drove off. They could still hear the sound, so they were absolutely terrified. And this is just showing you sort of like the so, so you know there's lights in the sky seen by people, but these are much more intense events. So. So the schoolboys watching something come down, landing, dropping legs. The, the fishermen uh, having seeing this this bright light in the sky and this grinding noise coming from nowhere, and the man being sucked out the window. So that's really just a teaser of what the Kempsey flap was like. And I mean, you know, it's it's something that, that as I said, is easily a three-hour discussion just in that. But that's three events that occurred within a couple of weeks in and around the Kempsey district. And overall, I would say there's probably at least probably up to 30 incidences that occurred around that time. And all of them are high quality to different degrees. So that, that flap, and this is the thing, like a lot of this stuff, you know, like it's known by ufologists and people who've done UFO history research but the general public don't have any idea about these events. You could probably go to Kempsey now and be lucky to find anyone who's still alive from who, you know, the people could have been 50, 60 back in 1971. They'd be near dead by now. So, or would be dead by now. So, so these events are getting lost, lost, lost. So bringing them out again now and, and shaking them off and dusting them off and airing them for everybody to now see. So, so people in the 21st century can now revisit these extraordinary old Australian cases that had occurred. Now, I think I'd vaguely heard of a, of a flap in Kempsey, but until I started actively reading about it and saw how high intensity it was, I became very excited about this, this event. And I spoke to Bill Chalker about it because he'd actually been there at the time and, and, and interviewed the witnesses at the time. So I had to chat to him about it and, and he was very helpful as well. So, yeah, that's... That's a that's just a teaser. Oh, thank you, Ben. Can I just uh, ask a question, Ben? Oh, yeah. not really ask a question. Well, what year was the um the one where the boys heard the grinding sound of going fishing? Uh that was 71. Interesting, because in 75 I heard uh, I've never heard anyone describe something like that. And when my car was lifted off the ground by a big white light on a lonely country back road. Um, I described this massively loud gr metallic grinding sound that was completely overwhelming, and I'd never heard anything like it in my life. Wow, that's terrifying. amazing! Terrifying. Yeah, yeah, and that's what, that's what these fishermen—they just picked up picked up rods in hand, uh, wicker tackle box, and and bolted back to the car. Mm. Amazing. <laughs> I, I like you, Ben. I had. Um, uh, I was vaguely aware of it, but uh, I wasn't actively involved in UFO research in the 70s, but, uh, yeah, yeah, very vaguely. Uh, but when you said you were digging around in it, I thought that um, and that there was so much of it, I thought, wow, that's amazing. I'd love to hear a lot more. So, yeah. yeah. Well, I've given you, like, the briefest, mm -hmm. and that's only three mm -hmm. sort of teaser cases that occurred around Kempsey that were high quality, high strangeness, credible witnesses, uh, and they kind of like sort of like led into the to, the to the rest of the events that happened in that period of time. And then not just 1971, 1972, it did extend into 73, 74 and 75. Yeah. So there were other high quality, less, less quantity, but still high quality events occurring as late as 1975. And, yeah. they, that, and one thing I also want to add to uh Susie is that that ground that grounding sound had been heard had been heard on multiple occasions mm. Mm. interesting yeah. mm. interesting good old 70s eh yeah. <laughs> bring them back yeah. I was um, just a, I sorry. Was about four years old when it happened <laughs> <laughs> lucky you oh, I wish I was how old I was <laughs> Well, um, uh, thank you for that, for both of you. And I've got a couple to share too quickly. And I must um, um, apologise too because I was so quick to jump into this. I, there's a couple of new people here tonight and I didn't introduce Susie or Ben. And uh, Susie's from uh, You Focus in New Zealand uh, and Ben is from UFO Vic in uh, Victoria. So they're both long-time UFO researchers. 
This was a photo that was sent to us by the Courier Mail. And uh, if you're on Facebook, you would have, I think I posted this one. And it was um, uh, it was on the 20th of September, so very, uh, very recent, above the Q1 Tower on the Gold Coast. And it was forwarded to the Courier Mail by a man uh, on the Gold Coast who, uh, and the Courier Mail wanted to know if we thought it was real. So uh, now I've lost my, where are we? There we go. So, um, which we didn't think it was. And if you see the photograph on the left, uh, there is a smudge here. And when you blow it up, you can see more of it here, which I've highlighted. And this object in the sky was the object in question, but um, that's it blown up there. And I th I'm pretty sure that it was a downlight reflection from the building that the photograph was taken. And someone on Facebook asked you, well, if that's true, how come there's not um, more of them? But actually someone who's a security officer said if the floor is not being used at the time, they usually only have one light on. So I thought that was a pretty good explanation. Uh, and I think, Ben, you had a look at it too. Yeah, that's a classic downlight. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. We'd all love it to be something else, but yeah, wouldn't we? Yeah, that? yeah. yeah, it's definitely a downlight. You know, case closed. <laughs> now the other one was this one from Nelson Plains on the tenth of August, um, and I just get my notes here. It was. Uh, oh, I'm still. I'm still. Whoops, wrong one. I'm still sharing my notes there. <laughs> Hang on, I've lost it. Uh, this was taken by a woman who was uh, driving home um, uh, in the evening from work, I think it was. No, she'd been out somewhere with friends, that's right, and she was coming home and she saw this particular thing. Uh, she actually saw a light on the side, off to the side of the road in uh, hovering about, uh, I think it was about uh, just not very high above the field, maybe uh, 20, 40 metres, I think she said something like that. And it, it lifted up and it drove over the road across where she was uh, and flew off to behind her very slowly. And so she hung out the window and she got a photo of it. So it's an interesting photo. I don't know exactly um, what that is, but it, I didn't think it was a plane hovering over the field. Uh, on the side of the road. I'm not sure if anyone else wants to jump in with some ideas about that. Feel free. Mm. Anyone got any clue, Ben or Susie? Well, it's it's interesting. I mean, you know, like it's it, the other thing I was sort of thinking was, you know, like a landing lights on a, on a uh, commercial airliner, you know, but it probably doesn't really sort of match up with that. But it's like all these nighttime photos, there's just no points of reference to, to uh to sort of take much out of them other than it's just that the puzzling factor of, of what it could be you know like i don't know that that drones have that type of lighting on them certainly not anything outside of a military sized drone not something you can buy at toy world yeah um, so yeah it's uh, it's 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 just hard to say yeah and uh sam you're asking do stealth bombers have lights under them like this uh I'm not exactly sure, but um, I also don't think they're completely silent. No, no, no. There's, there's a bit of a misnomer about stealth aircraft. Stealth aircraft are not visible on radar. They still sound noisy. Yeah, that's <laughs> what know, I they're, thought. They're, they're not silent because if you can watch videos of them taking off in America and the B the B twos and that taking out in America, they're as loud as anything. So it's just the way they the way they're built that they're they're resistant to radar detection. Not not they don't run quietly. Mm. Susie, any thoughts? No, 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 no. Okay, just listening to everyone else. And what I, what I would say, you know, like it's you know, like the photo is one thing. It's the story that's the that's probably that's probably needs the like the bigger focus than, mm. than the photo yeah. itself. So yeah. you know, time, date, where, when, weather check. Yeah. Uh, flight radar check into that location. That's the sort of stuff that, that that probably gets closer to what the answer is. So if you can tick off what it's not, then you know, then you, and you're only left with the one conclusion that it's unknown. 
then you can sort of say that yeah, well, you know, this is this is a true unknown. Yeah. But unless you've done, unless you've done, I mean, it's obviously not a weather phenomenon, but unless you've done weather phenomenon check, flight radar check, and checked, you know, even International Space Station just for due diligence, it's not that either. But yeah, you know, you've got to go through all those checks. The story's got to be cross-checked. You've got to do a Google map of the location in daytime to see exactly where it was. It's very hard to estimate altitude in the dark. So, you know, it's, it's, it's very difficult when you've got this sort of, this sort of information. And, but it, supports, it's, it can support the, the, uh, the veracity of the tale, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other one I wanted to show you was this one was taken by um, a woman, uh, East Maitland, again, fairly recently, 8.48 p.m., um, I think I, the story goes that she and her partner pulled up to the side of the road for some reason and um, this object just came up in front of them uh, above the rise and this is the actual photo that was uh, she took and you can actually see the, the object, that's her sketch of the triangle and underneath with those lights, which I've seen before on round craft as well. And this this here is the actual shape and this is like a sort of like an emanating cloud around it and these dots here were what she's tried to depict on the corner so that's an actual photograph so I thought that was very interesting too I don't know how to explain it but again it's another sort of triangular shaped object that um people had seen uh, so that's that's so that's that's a, a grab of it so that's that's yeah not- that's a grab yeah that's- Exactly. Yeah, it's not the not how she took it originally. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just, yeah, I'm just blowing it up so people can see it. Um, so yeah. let's get into our topic for the evening. Uh, I'm just going to shut that. Which is, um, should ufology die? And um, the reason I uh, chose this topic is because. Um, of an article that was published in the Liberation Times written by um, on the 5th of September 2022 and by Lou Elizondo, who was the former U.S. Army counterintelligence special agent and former employee of the Office of the Undersecretary of Defence for Intelligence. And yeah. he, um, he, the piece he wrote was entitled Why Ufology Must Die. And the reason Elizondo gave for stating his wish was so that after ufology's demise, uh, whatever it places, it should be something more holistic and harmonised within a community that is far more academically serious and intellectually representative of the topic. And he further stated he wants the to instil rigour, discipline and professionalism into whatever follows the death of ufology. So um, I just wanted to start off with Susie and Ben. Maybe you'd like to um, give some uh, thoughts about uh, what what is in that part of his article anyway. Well, I thought the article overall was um, it has a lot of points that we could discuss. We could really take this article to pieces bit by bit. Um, in, in the sense of some of the phrases and some of the issues and things he expresses. But overall, um, I found it quite repetitive, almost juvenile, if I can put it that way. Um, it sounds like someone who doesn't really know what's been going on in ufology, as Ben has talked about, for decades. Mm. Sounds like someone who just doesn't know that and is trying to reinvent the wheel so that some other agenda can play out or some other process can take place whereby they can just kiss goodbye to um, to everything that's taken place beforehand and all of the research that's been done and all of the people who could be consulted, including our good selves, um, and dozens and dozens of other uh, researchers around the world who've done a lot of really good work for a long time. Um, it's almost like the the whole process that's happening in the States at the moment is trying to start history in 2004, 2007 and move it forward uh, for their own purpose. And I can talk a little bit more about that in a minute later on. But, um, but what he's suggesting really is that science should step in and the professionals should step in, et cetera. But does he not know 
that there are hundreds of scientists around the world who have already been in, involved in this subject um, for decades. And some of those people who've been quietly working in the background are now beginning to step forward and say, this is what I've been doing. This is what I've been involved in. And I'm then quite... there are the seemingly chosen few scientists who are becoming the mouthpieces. You know, we've got Avi Loeb, et cetera, becoming the mouthpieces and, and of ufology. And even um, if people like Misha Kaku has done an, an about face because not too many years ago, he was saying it's unlikely that we're going to meet aliens. And now he says they're here. So, um, you know, I'd, I'd, some of the things he's suggesting here, yeah, that's good. It's pie in the sky, but a lot of the stuff that he's suggesting has already been happening and he doesn't seem to know about it. Hmm. I think that's quite disturbing for someone who's making such a big name for himself hmm. and um, and getting a lot of people on side and convincing a, a lot of the easily convinced that he's the mouthpiece and he's going to bring forward disclosure, him and, and a handful of others. And I think that's quite disturbing, some of the things he's said. And yes, rightly so, some of the comments he has made about the infighting and ufologies and the egos, et cetera, yes, we all see that taking place. But um, if we dig a bit deeper than that, this is a great foundation of ufology, a, a mass of of um, archives and information such as we've been talking about tonight. And, uh, and there's the contacts with, the, with this, the witnesses. And sometimes when a researcher makes contact with the witnesses, that can, contact can continue for decades and they almost become friends because they have shared something that you understand. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's all very well to be saying that science should be involved but on the other hand as an experiencer as well i also know that science at the, this point in time can't explain a lot of the things that are happening that's a really good point too yeah mm -hmm. we just we just don't know no you know, our scientists probably don't know no no more than than the lay person really when it comes to to what this is and where it's coming from and so they, they don't know the answers either Mm. Uh, I, look, I think his intention. I think he's. I think he's well intended. I think. I think that's that's the, that's the first thing. It's very. It's very sort of clumsily written, uh, and he's not eloquent either. So he's so he's not expressing it in a very, in a. I suppose it's just a just a real basic sort of a sort of a essay with sort of statement type um, sentences that are in it. So I, I didn't read it. Um, I, I didn't get sort of insulted by it from the point of view that, uh, well, you know, well, everybody's been doing all this work all these years. I thought, you know, and I take the point that you made, Susie, that that he 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 doesn't know what's been going on over the years. You know, he he can't he can't say some of the things he says in that article if you knew what had been going on over the years. And 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 I think he's talking about this sort of he wants this harmonious and holistic approach to to something new not not ufology whatever you want to call it in the future um and you know so that's that's rather nebulous in itself so he's talking about holistic and harmonized and then he's talking about let's get the scientists involved so if you've got the scientists involved you're most likely not going to have harmonized or, or holistic you know because <laughs> that's not where it, that's not where it comes from i think that's a that's a major a major problem with what he with what he's saying uh and Yes, it's a, it's a, it, it's, it's like all. It's not just ufology. There's, you know, there's, there's fractious stuff all around the world in, 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 in any topic under the sun, and it's quite natural for, for human beings to not agree, to have different points of view, to have, you know, you know, more holistic approaches as opposed to nuts and bolts approaches to ufology. I think he's, uh, you know, I think as you said, like there's already a whole vast number of scientists involved. So this is that kind of makes this this whole article a little irrelevant as well. Like there are people are are already doing the work, you know. So so that's actually happening as well. This work is already being done by qualified people. There's been a lot of uh, civilian researchers who have done some extraordinary work. Have done you know have documented many things here in Australia and overseas as well. So it's and I think he focuses too much on the modern side of it as in like the social media side of it that's just a circus 
you know, like it really is, you know, you, you don't go to social media for, for what I would call serious and real information in a, in a lot of cases. Most of it is either clickbait or just, um, you know, just you know, about entertainment, you know. So, so he, he, but he sort of he focuses on that and he focuses on you know, all these personalities that are all trying to be someone and all that sort of stuff. Well, you know, I'm, there is some of that going on, but, but anyone who seriously spends any time in this topic and hours and hours of research will know that there's no shortcuts to, to getting anywhere in, 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 this, in this field. And there's very little money in it. <laughs> you know, there's extraordinarily little money in, in researching this as a, as a private researcher. Um, in fact, you spend money. So that's the, that's, that's the reality of it. There's, there's no money and there's very little, there actually is very little glory and, glory and fame to be had uh, out there in, in this topic. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm prepared to listen to, you know, like a, a fresh approach or, you know, maybe we need to rethink a few things. But the whole problem even with that approach is that, is that you're just not going to get everybody to agree. That's, the, that's the, whole, the whole thing. And I think he's also intimating it some type of a body or some type of a group to wipe away ufology. Let's just push it off the face of the earth, get rid of that. And we're going to come in with something else, something new and we'll give it a name and this will be the new thing. Well, that already exists as well. So, <laughs> yeah. 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 So I don't quite see that, that, that anything that he's saying in that article, I'm not really attacking him, but like <laughs> there's nothing in there that, that and I've got nothing against him, but it's just not sort of a relevant or helpful article. Mm. I think one um, comment he makes, which is really naive, is he says, unfortunately, the reality show social media circus of today has challenged the government's confidence in ufology as a worthy area to study. Well, if the government bases its, um, its view of ufology on social media, well, for goodness sake, the government must well know the people who are doing bona fide work in the field and if they're not going to approach um, the relevant researchers around the world who hold big archives um, then why say that they're they're disappointed in us because of the way social media operates so social media is, is only a tiny fraction of what has been done in the, in the ufo field over many decades mm. so uh, i thought that was um you know they said that conspiracy theories and disclosure advocates are further alienating anyone in our government willing to champion the cause. Well, I don't think we actually need anyone to champion the cause. And um, and I think of all the scientists who have been quite open about their involvement, like Stanton Friedman, who was a nuclear physicist, and, and many other scientists, uh, Eamon Ansbro, who is a, a, um, an astronomer in Ireland who's part of our group ISA. Um, these scientists have been in there a long time, but they can't get um, any government to listen to them. You know, they've been ridiculed and dragged down. People like Captain Robert Salas in the States, etc. cetera. The, there's been scientists and professionals working in this area for a long time, but they've got no more notice than any of the rest of us who don't have the same qualifications. Mm, I don't think the government, honestly, is that interested in, in what, civilian researchers are doing anyway because if you look back at the 1950s uh you know if you had a ufo report you rang the air force and some put upon left-handed or someone had to take your call and yes 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 take down the details and thank you very much that's yes that's that's probably just it's probably just clouds or whatever so and that was that was the entire approach that they had and then the australian air force said well we're not just going to do this anymore we're going to we're going to actively encourage the civilian groups to take over the public. We don't want the public calling us with what they see in the sky. We don't need old Mrs. Smith sitting on her back veranda, ringing us because she's seen something off of her. We don't want to deal with that stuff. So the civilian research groups were, from that perspective at that time, were to take over and that from, from, the, from, the, uh, from the Air Force. And it did for many, many years. But and, and, of course, there were some great groups. And, and the, the government does know who to talk to if they, wanted, if they were going to talk to. The government does know who that is. But in the last, say, from, the, from this century, so from the 21st century onwards, 
all of that has has just become it's disappeared into the background because the, the rise of of the internet and the social media has let er, anyone who's got a mouthpiece has taken over and the the good the good stuff is getting is getting left behind more and more by this voluminous never ending uh, stuff that's appearing on on the social medias and he makes he makes this point in the article he says uh, sadly the UFO community as of late has become somewhat of an irrational morass of mob rule well I find that really interesting of mob rule and popularity seekers. Well, you know, I, I can, you know, I can see what he's saying about popularity seekers, but mob rule, I mean, that suggests we're on the streets of Mogadishu holding um, machetes in our hands. Like, you know, like that's crazy. Gone is the respect and the decorum in favour of mosh pit elbow shoves and boot kicks. Voices of those who would otherwise apply a scholarly focus are being drowned out by the social media person. That's the point that I was making. So, you know, that's it's it's the way that he says it you know i can see that that yeah i understand what he's trying to say um but the core of the ufo research community is is as strong as it ever was the governments know who to talk to if they if they're even going to talk to them but you know i don't, I don't think that they need to uh and you know it, the the changing landscape I, I, I take the point of being you know is is ufology relevant now that's probably a better question because as soon as the American Navy releases some more gun cam footage and, and they give us something with a bit more some substance to it, it's kind of like say, well, this is a, you know, yeah, it's real, you know? And, you know, it's, you know, and that's what it's taking for people to, to, for the broader community to come out and say, yes, this is real. I can talk about Kempsey till I'm blue in the face, but that's only going to get a, attach an audience of 10 people. You get Navy gun camera footage, and that's just going to go right across the planet. Mm. I think that uh, Elizondo was probably is talking to social media about social media. I think he was really referring to um, what's going on in the states, and yeah. particularly on Twitter. Um, yes. Because if you put hashtag UFO Twitter after anything on Twitter, then it's just like it's like a you know um, dog to a bone, and everyone pulls it apart or. All the trolls come out. Has some sort of um, opinion about whatever's going on. Yeah. But um, I, with the article, I thought, I, I read the article and I felt really uneasy after reading it um, because, uh, you know, even though Elizondo said that the phoenix rising from the ashes of ufology's demise would be a new type of ufology that promotes a thoughtful study by the scientific and academic communities and by other discipline researchers, uh, providing a steady regiment of data-driven logic. Uh, I know that there is, you know, anecdotal reports mean nothing. So there, there goes out the window alien abduction experiences or contact experiences, etc. Uh, humility, academic rigor, again, there goes out the window, um, you know, per people's personal accounts. And transparency, which I know is not going to happen at all um, because we haven't had it until you know all along i think that it's a bit of a fairy tale full of stardust and you know wishful thinking on a full moon really uh, i just don't think it's going to happen um so i i think he's living in a bit of a dream world where he wants um you know he wants he, i think he goes on in the article to say that he, we're academic scientists um elected officials government leaders theologians etc work together on the ufo subject and I just can't see that happening. No, um, it's not realistic. He also it's, says in this new environment, there is trust and respect between the academic scientists and government organisations acting as custodians mm. for the hard data that needs to be studied and evaluated. So at the moment, we're seeing a lot of archives being accessed, being taken up, being uh, disappearing. Um, so there are... I, I, share the same unease that you feel Cheryl that the researchers who've who've done the legwork for a long time and who know the the, the data um, are excluded from this they are not the custodians so someone wants the data but they don't want us they don't want our knowledge of it they just want to sift through it and find anything to do with technology consciousness 
any details about the entities, etc. And this will be studied behind closed doors. And I'm getting that you're referring to Newsbon. And at this point, I want to introduce something else that, <laughs> that is related to this. So um, I'll just find my bit of paper. So you, your group has had Robert Fleischer from Germany speak to you, is that correct? Yep, yep. So everyone will know him. Well, well Robert um, recently did um, an interview with Chris Mellon. Now, as it turns out, it seems, and this is, this is hearsay, this piece, um, that, uh, like, if we look at a chain of command, Chris Mellon's up here and Elizondo's down here, but in the same chain of command, I think. Um, so, you know, we're getting these mouthpieces that are, that are talking and um, doing the talking out there and making, um, you know, becoming well known. And is Elizondo one of these mouthpieces? But in a recent interview that Robert Fleischer did with Chris Mellon at the Barcelona conference in Spain, it's in German. He has just done the transcript in English and he, has given, he hasn't published it yet. It's going to be very interesting when you read it. I have the English transcript, but I can't um, disclose it, but he has given me permission to quote a few lines. So Robert Fleischer asked Chris Mellon, so they'd been discussing how the government wants to get together all this information and go through it and find out some details. And Robert says, so all the information that will be collected will be classified. What's the benefit for the, benefit for the rest of the world besides the US? And Chris Mellon replied, it's not being done for the benefit of the world. And Robert Fleischer said, it's being done for the benefit of the United States. And Chris Mellon says, it's being done for national security of the United States. That's the initial, initial rationale and justification. And don't forget that you and I are talking about the extraterrestrial aspect and possibility here. And he goes on to talk about um, technology and other things. So what he's saying is that... Um, all of this stuff coming out of the States that so many in ufology have got all excited about, that disclosure is coming. No, disclosure is not coming. In fact, from my perspective, they're slowly and quietly starting to put the lid on disclosure. And a lot of people have rushed to provide some of these people who are coming out from the government, such as Elizondo, et cetera, they're providing them with information. They're rushing to say, look, here's my stuff. Take a look at this, because they think it's helping disclosure. But in fact, according to this, it's not going to help anyone except the United States from a point of view of security of the United States. So when we're looking at the military and all the footages coming out, et cetera, we are looking at national security it's a national security threat and there's that word threat mm. now we can understand that the military is going to look at aerial craft things that go into the sea and are seen in space etc um and in the air in our atmosphere they're going to look at that as a threat if it's seen over their country and they don't know what it is so um the thing that is that is coming to the fore is that that these Naval footages, et cetera, are, are easy to use as the, as the instigation that makes it look as if they're opening up to all of this. But what they're doing is, I believe, opening up to gathering data. But he has implied that um, that, that data is not necessarily going to be available to the public. It's going to be classified because it's national security. And this is being done not for the benefit of the world and world disclosure. This is being done for the benefit of the United States and their national security. There's something in their airspace. They want to find out what it is. Well, um, we're not in, you know, as Cheryl said, I think, or might have been Ben, we're not personally insulted by this, but it is putting a stain on a lot of uh, good people in ufology who've worked really hard. It, it is putting the stigma on them that, that, that he is saying should be removed from the subject. Mm. It's, it's having that very effect on, 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 on us. 
Well, actually, I did feel a bit insulted and I felt like that the article was a bit of a slap in the face, to tell you the truth, because there are a lot of people who have given up, you know, lots of time and energy over the years and oh, you know, their, their personal life, their family time to to actually do this work. And I was really interested where he said, um, uh, what did he say, something like likening the death of ufology to a fire in unhealthy crop or a farmer's field where the destruction of one thing often gives rise to something much better and healthier and the best crops grow when the overgrowth is gone and the soil is rich in nutrients. And I'm thinking, I'm He's sorry. at Australian bushfires. I'm, I'm sorry, but unless ufology existed in the first place, there would be no alien compost to fill into the, the scientific soil, you know. Yeah, it's, it's almost dramatic, like isn't it? Yeah. It's almost like he's saying, okay, okay, it's time for the big boys to take over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we know what we're doing. That's yeah. the impression that I, that I get of it, you know, like, you know, I, you know, I am an unfunded guy who does this part-time, works a 60-hour-a-week full-time job and puts whatever spare minutes he can in, into, into this trying to lead a balanced life. And a lot of other people are like that out there, some more time, less time, uh, depending on what, what we're at. But, but none of us have got huge amounts of funding to do anything, really. And, you know, and he's saying that this is, this is such a fractious thing. It's, it's so fractured, and it is. Um, but it's time for the big boys to, to, to come along and take that out. Well, I don't know who, who, who that's going to be, really. Like, you know, it, 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 which, which scientists are you going to choose and, and who you're not going to insult there? You know, like it's, it's a minefield. Yeah. It's like years and years yeah. and years. Yeah, it feels like a bit like jockeying to get the data to me. And, um, yep. you know, it's a bit like Susie in the 90s when I spoke at that conference in Sydney, you were there and you always bring it up. Uh, and I, it was about, you know, after after contact, when Ali, when UFOs land after contact or something. And, um, and I always felt like there'd be a lot of jockeying with all people from different institutions trying to be the, the people who... Uh, got that information or were there to to um, to say, hey, you really, really need to talk to us because, you know, we're the best people on this planet for you to talk to, that sort of thing. And I'm getting the sense of that in this particular article that Elizondo has spoken to, that, you know, the military and, and the government uh, and all these other things are the best people to talk to about this subject, If you know, um, and yet... Um, you know, like Ben said before, the in Australia, the RAAF in '94 sent out a letter to all the civilian groups saying we don't want anything to do with this anymore. You know, like yeah, hello. Yeah, that's very interesting, Cheryl, because um, in New Zealand, when the files came out, we lobbied for the for the files to be released in 2008 and nine. They were released in 10 and 11, and um, their final statement to the citizens of New Zealand was that as far as we are concerned, this is the MOD, as far as we are concerned, all um, these aerial uh, anomalies can be explained by misidentified aircraft or natural phenomena. And we're washing our hands of it. We just think it's ridiculous, basically. And um, and if you see something that you can't explain, well, go and you can report it to the police or you can report it to a civilian um, UFO group. Mm, yeah. yeah. Exactly. And they just disowned it, even though even though um, they have got, uh, obviously got intelligence files because uh, a lot of the sightings that we've got on record, some of the really big historic ones were not in there. The ones that have been in the media were in there, but the ones that didn't make the media, um, even though they were really unusual and a lot of detail, they weren't in the file and they should have been. Mm. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Same with the Australian files too. All. There's no files on Westall. There's no files on on any of the Australia's big cases in in any of the public files that have been released. So you know that stuff all went to America. Yeah, mm. exactly. Yeah, uh, I got one. So just one of the quick comment I want to make too yeah. is that you know is the world expecting some Columbus moment when he sets foot into the new world? Like, is that is that what we're really expecting here? Like. You know, are the aliens going to come and they're going to land on the steps of the White House and it's going to be a Columbus in the new world? It's just, it's just not going to happen. You know, I, I can't see that as any type of reality in, in, in any way, shape or form. These, yeah. these intelligences from other places, wherever they're coming from, like the Americans, have their own agenda. 
So, you know, the, as much as the Americans are concerned about national security, the, whoever's invading their national security is doing it because A, they can, and because of B, it's part of their agenda. It's not the Chinese or the Russians. So, you know, it's, it's you know, like there's very little that, that, that really anyone can do in, in, in many ways when it comes to this. And the other thing too is what happens if they land on the steps of Mongolia, you know, <laughs> like, you know, or in the in the in the Amazon rainforest. Or what if it's somewhere, or Antarctica, or somewhere where none of these scientists and groups and whoever all this stuff, like it's whatever the aliens do, it's going to be on their own time and their own agenda, and they won't they won't give a tuppenny about how we're prepared or ready for it, and if it's even even going to happen at any time because they're happy doing what they do. If they if they can go straight into the earth, or they can go straight into the sea where there may be bases down there, they're happy, you know. Mm. They don't have to talk to us, you know. Well, I'm being a little bit simplified there, but, you know, that's – I suppose the point I'm trying to make is it just shows you how how powerless that, the, that humans are with this phenomenon. Mm. And I think power has got a – you've hit the nail on the head that get the gathering of information that is going on at, at the moment, and I do – think, and this is only my personal opinion, that a lot of these big big name guys coming out, ex-CIA agents, ex-Pentagon, et cetera, um, are part of the information gathering tactic, what they are doing. People believe that, that they are leading to disclosure. Um, disclosure is, is a, a mute point. Um, and I had an experiencer say to me recently, um, I'm doing this work that I'm doing in the UFO field, in the contact field, uh, for my great-grandchildren because it could take that long. Mm. And I may not see any of it. No, that's right. Um, You know, so that's a really good point to ponder on. Um, Mm. You know, there's a lot of information gathering and data gathering at the moment, and that's because someone feels threatened, someone is feeling their power slipping away, someone is feeling that there's something in the air and under the sea that has more power than them. Mm, I think so. And they're afraid of it. Mm. Um, Just on the point of disclosure, James asks, he says, I'm always confused by the term disclosure. What does that actually mean? Would one of you like to? uh... Sharing or admitting, I suppose, probably explain it, don't they? You know, like sharing what we actually know or admitting, yes, this is actually real. Disclosure is really just a word that, that is another word for those words. But it's sort of become the catch cry in the in the world of ufology that, that it's disclosure. It's not just, you know, come on, admit it, admit it, come on, admit it. So, you know, and it's become such a, a heavy weighted word and, a, and perhaps a bit of a powder keg of a word. And I think as we've sort of said, like it's it's kind of like a bit of a wet, a wet keg fizzer, really. <laughs> That's Someone has put in the chat, well, haven't the US government essentially said it's real? Well, they have, mm. um, but but it's there's a lot of people out there who want more than that. Mm. Um, they it's want good, yeah. they want admissions and they want details and they want admissions on things like Roswell and some of the other major sightings. They want to know what really happened. They want the answers, and, and I think they're going to be disappointed in the long run. There's a lot of caveats to the US government saying that it's real. Mm. So, yeah. you know, there is something that our fighters have intercepted. Yes, that's true. We don't know what it is. We're concerned about it from a national security perspective. Okay. We don't think it's the Russians and the Chinese, but but they can still play that card if they if they really wanted to, they could play that card. So they're not outright coming out and saying that, you know, this, yes, this is the aliens, people. They are absolutely here. There's still a lot of couched type of terminology around it. Hmm. I think at um, the point they don't know what it is. I think that they don't know what it is. That's yeah. what I was just saying then. Yeah. Stephen Bassett talks about disclosure with a little d and disclosure with a big D. And I think disclosure with a little d has already happened. It's happened through history that there are certain people who come out in in the know who've come out and said. You know, um, we don't know what this is. It's not of uh, its its origin isn't from Earth. Uh, but then I think other people, like Susie was saying, want more, and they want the big D disclosure, where 
there are announcements, you know, on in the media and in uh, documents. And yes, and downloads of released. documents. Mm. Yes. Yeah, so, Columbus, you know, Columbus footfalls, you know, that sort of stuff. It's yeah. But it's it's raining down, um, you know, information about UFOs and alien a, alien interaction. Yeah, but and, and, and the other the other thing too is that is that I've, is that I've, you know, I've heard that a lot of the the actual tech and the bodies and that are actually in private industry. So you know where you don't have to reveal a damn thing. You mean like Skunk Works something? Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. like you know, and uh, Bigelow and all that. Like yeah. you know, the pieces of That's Roswell right. probably are no longer sitting at the Wright Patterson Airfield Base. Mm. They've been long disseminated to to the people who don't have to talk about it. And can you really see them getting the dollies out of cold storage, wheeling them out with the with the forty seven with the nineteen forty seven bodies on them, and parading them for for CNN to show to the world? No. <laughs> you might like to explain that a bit for people, some people who don't know what that means, Ben. CNN. No dollies. Oh, dollies! You know, like the the dollies, <laughs> the trolleys they use in the in the in the uh, morgues where they put the bodies on top and they wheel them out and they go, here you go. Are you happy now? Now we can put them back in. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, there are a couple of other things I wanted to bring up too where um, in, in Elizondo's Ufology Dream World where he says topics such as xenoscience, exopolitics, astrobiology and ex exotheology would not be ostracised as fringe science. Um, my question is then, can those institutions actually work together? Because historically, science and, you've, and theology on this world have been at odds um, since they split. Um, so, and I, oh gosh, when was that? About the 12th century or something? No, when Galileo and um, Copernicus, um, uh, with their astronomical observations, you know, started to take science beyond what theology could accommodate. So, um, I don't even know if uh, theology and uh, exotheology and exoscience could even work together if they're whatever that means. <laughs> what no, do you no. think? Yeah, well, um, we, we know we, we've talked before, Cheryl, at, at length about the new age intrusion. Yeah. And, and that bit you read out just has a ring about it of the, of the let's broaden it out. Um, because the more you broaden it out, the more you dilute it, mm. and there's a real danger in diluting the good data, the good stuff, um, and, and allowing, as Robert Salas has said, anyone to rush through that open door and feel that they are part of it. Um, so, you know, you're, you're, you look at, you've got to differentiate between the, the real research and pseudo what some people see as pseudo research i don't mm -hmm. know um it's it's a crazy thing for him to have said given the fact that the american government for so long has has had no interest in things like that or has um you know decried that kind of thing and talking about it on um social media you know it's it fits in the same sort of box as his social media comments so it's a strange um dichotomy there for him to have have mentioned mm. um yeah it certainly is when when monty python's the life of brian came out in about nine well 1979 i think it came out sometime around then john cleese and um uh michael palin went on to um the michael parkinson show and 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 debated with the archbishops of the church of england about the life of Brian and the church's views. And that's just what came to mind for me about getting these two parties together to, to, agree, to, to talk, agree, and work, work, to, work to a solution together. It's, it's pretty difficult. I'm not saying it's impossible, but, you know, there'd be a lot of water that you'd have to pass under the bridge to, to, to make it functional, I think. He's talking about dysfunction in ufology as it is. I think that dysfunctionality is just going to continue in a different format, mm -hmm. or, or it has the or it has the danger of that continuing in another format. Yeah, I I agree with that. And just to pick up on that, he says further in the article that um, something about uh, we have to allow ourselves to pragmatically frame up the what ifs into some form of academic or scientific nomen nomenclature nomenclature. I don't know exactly how you say that, but basically. 
Um, and I, th I think signs of that are already appearing with the exchange of the term UFOs to UAPs, right? Mm -hmm. So they're creating the, I, I can just see a whole new terminology being yeah. created to diffuse the whole subject. And now UAP is becoming transmedium vehicle. Yep. yep. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't like that. <laughs> yeah. So they're introducing things that that make it uh, make it sound to the uninformed general public that they are talking about something slightly different to what we've yeah. been talking about for decades. So that there is a deliberate separation here that gives them the control and the, the up to date image and gives us well we're superfluous. Mm, That's mm. the way it seems to me anyway. Yeah. You know? Um, it's reinventing the wheel, isn't it? It's um, giving it new terminology and a new gloss, a glossy cover on a magazine, and it becomes something else in many people's minds. Mm, the Department of Name Changes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think it's obvious that the that the interest in UFOs isn't going away unless something changes, and that is, you know, s get rid of all the history, change the wording, and eventually it'll peter out. And I think that's that's possibly one hope anyway whilst whilst in the background as usual control you know absorbing all the information and then controlling it he also says we we now must take more care now than ever in how we engage the public hmm. Hmm. yeah interesting isn't it so this uh, you know there's there's the hint of a of a whole new way of engaging the public that there's that separation thing again mm. um you know we have we've had some terminology in the ufo field over the years such as you know you're a nuts and bolts researcher okay so it's very easy to introduce new terminology that denigrates a, a particular group of of people mm. and and you know we're possibly going to see some more of that Mm. And, then, and you just confuse you, you confuse the general public. I mean, UFO has been around for a, a very long time. Everyone on the planet knows exactly what it means. But a UFO could be a flying goose, right? Or it could be a comet, or it could be a flying saucer. Like I think that's what people forget. A UFO is not a flying saucer. It's just an unidentified flying object. It could be a kite. Mm. It could be a can of beer going through the air. Like you know, that's what a UFO is. You know, and early on, flying saucer was the description of what they were seeing. You know, it's a flying saucer. And that was invented by the media anyway. So, you know. And UAP was invented just to um, separate it slightly from UFO because it, that UFO has stigma now. So that's a little separation there. And that became the scientific term, UAP. And now they're moving away from that now to transmedium vehicles. So and imagine if. We're yeah, probably going to see quite a few more changes. I think we will. So imagine if you went to do a Vox Pop in the centre of Sydney and you said, do you know what a UAP is? How many people that you interviewed on the streets of Sydney are going to tell you what a UAP is, let alone a transmedium vehicle? Let's say, what the hell is that? What's a UFO? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Actually, I thought that that went through uh, the UFO community when the term exopolitics was introduced because I was doing a hands up at public meetings, face-to-face -face meetings for quite a while there asking people, you know, how, did they know what that was? And I just got like crickets, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> people go, I don't know what, <laughs> and it's not exopolitics at all, you know, so um, mm. there's no politics involved in that particular, well, not the way I see it anyway. I haven't seen any pol politicking in exopolitics. Yeah, all the people sitting at home watching Channel 7 Spotlight series on a Sunday night while they've just finished their dinner, looking at the gun the gun camera footage, are not going to say, ooh, that's a UAP. Mm. You know, they're going to say, oh, was that a UFO? You know, mm. So I'm sort of still advocate that, that UFO has, a, when you're talking about the public, you know, all you're going to do is bamboozle and confuse them about all these other, these other technological terms that, that really are unnecessary. I yeah. haven't had a single report come in that says I've seen a U UAP. No. <laughs> Not a single no. one. Not a single one. Not a single one, you know. Mm. So, you know, it's and, and it depends how woke we want to get too, doesn't it? You know, like for, you know, off-world <laughs> entity or off-world, you know, whatever it is, you know. So 
it's, yeah. it can become a real minefield and it doesn't need to be that complicated. Yes, yeah, so I, I can just see aliens landing on Earth and, and asking, how do you identify? <laughs> oh, That's dear. Great. Yes. Uh, but anyway. Yeah. Um, I was just, um, I, I just think this is a really interesting conversation. I could see, you know, it could go on much more deeply. And, uh, but I just wanted to um, uh, if ask you to, if you've got anything more to last comments on that and then open it up for everyone else to have a, have an opinion. Well, yeah, <laughs> just one quick thing. Yeah. At least the article sparks debate. Yes, that's true. Got about- my attention. About the about the whole phenomena that everybody who's joining in on this meeting is interested in. Anything so, that makes you think. Anything that makes you think, whether you agree with it or don't agree with it, it's making you think, and that's a good thing. Mm. And yeah. someone has put James has put. Do we feel like at least the term transmedium vehicle suggests it's a vehicle instead of a phenomenon, which might not be a vehicle? Very good point. Yes, excellent point. Actually, excellent point. Yes. <laughs> okay, so I just wanted to you know open up to people who might want to make a, a comment or um, ask a question or just share your thoughts about about what we've been chatting about. Feel free to unmute yourself. All right, Sandra, I thought that uh, the comments that Susie made at the very beginning are very informative because I have not read that report. I thought that uh, when she said, what is this person's agenda? That was a question we should, we should ask ourselves. Mm. This person sounds from just what I've heard tonight, because as I said, haven't read the report, is that he considers himself and a few of his uh, colleagues as being elitist and is very dismissive of everybody else in the world. As far as I'm concerned, I will not accept his so-called authority from, you know, saying these things, because uh, why should we uh, say, well, you could have it all, and then none of it will be taken back to the rest of the world because of that statement about, you know, US security. Uh, business. Um, I think that it's very much a case of cancel culture. And we could have had a few political things here that were the same thing, like pull down the statues, you know, or let's forget history. Yeah. Those things all happen with the same kind of comments that we had tonight. So I think it's very dangerous what he's saying. Good point, Sandra. Excellent points, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? We've scared them off. Yes. <laughs> oh, Ben's going to jump in. Yeah, I was being polite. I thought I'd give someone else to go first. Um, ben, Linda Moulton, how? She reckons there's aliens in Antarctica, mate. You might want to research that one. Yeah. Did you see yeah, the interview I... with Chris Mellon? That was awkward. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm happy, to, happy for there to be aliens in Antarctica as well. <laughs> I'm not saying there is, but that's what Linda's saying. <laughs> um, Susie, you said under the sea. I've read your book, but I just picked up on that because I've been listening a bit about the Eric Davis notes at the moment. Mm. And they in, in there, there's four bases that they named through the remote viewing and one's Mount Zeal in Australia. Yep. But none, all of them are on land. Okay. And you sit under the sea. And it's... Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, lots of people... Dozens, hundreds of, of experiences have talked about undersea bases. And um, it's interesting tonight, I think I've mentioned this before, but I'll say it again. Um, Robert Salas from the Malmstrom Air Force Base incident in the States, um, he's a very good friend of mine, and um, he has been, he, he believes, to an undersea base, as I have described. And um, one of the reasons that we had a really long talk on one occasion on Zoom is because my description in my book, he was quite shocked to read it because it's as he remembers the entrance to um, to the ba- to a base, undersea base is, is identical to what I described. And um, he talks, one of the speeches that he does is actually about undersea bases and he's mm-hmm. used my material along with his own in that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, look, I, I don't disagree because where are the, a lot of the sightings and the you know, like the Tic Tacs and things like that. Mm. They're all over water. They're not over land. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah, 100%. Mm. Yeah, I, I, um, think, I think that they definitely, I think they've definitely got bases under the water. I think that would be mm. the most logical place to have a base. Yeah. Away from prying eyes. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
the other thing that I, I, I wrote heaps down, but um, uh, it was something about, you know, where you said about the uh, UFO versus UAP. I, I'm comfortable with whatever you want to call it because I always say UFO, UAP or whatever, but I like your point, Susie. No one's ever reported a UAP. It's always a UFO. Mm. But with the data, um, because just this week I've reported a sighting, uh, which was the one that I reported to you, Cheryl, a couple of months ago, um, but I've sent it off to a whole heap of people to try and find out what it is. Mm. Do you know how difficult it is to actually get anyone to take you seriously? Yes, I do, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I contacted Defence um, and I thought I'd start with Australian Space Force. Hey, what else are they doing? Because we haven't got any rockets at the moment. So um, I asked them and they told me to contact the University of Queensland because that would be my nearest thing and that was their procedure or I had to report it to MUFON. Yeah. Do they exist in Australia? Yeah, that they, they do have it. They do yeah. have a chapter. Yeah, there's um, Doctor is it Roger Stankovic, I think, in Sydney. Roger Stankovic. Okay. Yes, is the continental. Yeah, I, I knew they were around that, like previously, but I didn't think they were around anymore. I thought it just thought it was like that whole UFOs <laughs> side of things, and that was it. But yeah, um, yeah, I, I found that, and um, what was the other thing I wrote down? Uh, the, oh, the, the 2004, you know, where they're saying that they want to go from, you know, a set point. Robert Salas is the key. It's before 2004. Uh, Lou Elizondo and Chris Mellon are pushing this Eric Davis note, Eric Wilson, or Eric Davis Wilson note. Uh, it's from 2002. So is that why they wanted it from 2004 onwards? I, I, I don't have all the answers, but um, yeah, I wanted to go back to that reporting thing though what happens do you guys report them do you have contacts that you can go to from how does it work uh you you mean when a report comes into us yeah 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 correct depending on what it is um i mean we we'll, uh, we'll use um various apps to see if we can identify it ourselves first right yeah, to yeah. sort of go off the list um, but um, we have no contact with the RAAF. They don't really want to know us. Um, that was my point, exactly, because they told me to contact the local UFO group, yep. and if it was uh, validated, they would contact the Defence. So yep. when I contacted uh, University of Queensland, they didn't even have a clue what I was talking about. They didn't, even, they didn't want to know about it. Um, University of Southern Queensland have an astronomy department, and they wanted to know about it but they've never replied to my email. Uh, I've sent it off to a whole heap of people, including Sandia Labs today, uh, Parks, the, the dish. Uh, there's a guy down there who's a astrophysicist and he's looking at it for me um, because I've got a genuine UFO. No one can tell me what it is. I want to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, um, we're listed with um, CARE as well, which is the um, uh, Civil Aviation something, something, I can't remember what it is, and various private organisations, uh, the police. If anyone reports anything to any of those organisations, they just put them onto us. Right. You know, so, um, and then we really, all, all we can really do is try and identify something ourselves uh, and document it for, yeah. um, you know, for future records and hopefully future collaboration, you mm -hmm. know, as well. And, and that's about as far as we can go. If it's a, right. if it's a really, um, uh, like if someone reports a close encounter, for example, uh, we will often uh, go and interview them face-to-face. -face. Yep. Or I have done that on Zoom as well because if they're not in uh, it local, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but but does it then get passed on to anybody? Like, because there's there's a breakdown. There is no yes. global database, so to speak, where you can look at these things. If if there was one database, so to speak, you could then say, okay, well, we've had a thousand reports from Chile this week. Well, let's have a look over there. Yeah. Uh, you might be able to then identify the data. So, can I yeah. say something? Yes. yes like sir. I think that. They've, they've given you a place to send the information to, which is MUFON. You know, they're obviously trying to, 
yeah, but uh, I, direct all the info there. Why would I send it send to Send it to MUFON? Cheryl and send it to MUFON yeah. what they want you to do and then it's all in one place. Yeah, but I sent it to the UQ as well and I spoke to them. They, they don't even know what the Defence Force is talking about. Mm. And MUFON, no, MUFON does Arming you off. MUFON yeah, doesn't yeah. Really share information. Yeah. MUFON information. never Sorry. shares information. Yeah. The information is like a, a vacuum. It just sucks up all the information. Sucks it up, but it doesn't spit it out. And the, the actual investigators who, who interview witnesses, they try and then access their own reports and MUFON will not give it out. Mm. That's a problem. Yeah, that's, the, that's not the, how it should work. The purpose of the civilian uh, organisations is to provide a place where civilians can report their encounters to and the groups can offer support and analysis for that sighting so if it, if it was a traumatic experience then they can they can help you with that if, you, if it's just pure pure interest and i'm puzzled about what it was they can help you with that and eliminate all the logical explanations for it um, but beyond that ability of a civilian group there's no other let's bump it to the guys upstairs that's that just doesn't exist and yeah. that's and that's what the RAF did. They said, well, we don't want to take people's experiences through and have to talk to them about what they saw. That's where that's not what we do. You know, I spoke to the police and I asked the police and said, do you have a do you have a uh, a UFO policy or or training and operational stuff that if one landed on the highway, what, what would the police do? And they said, it's, it's not our area. Yeah, that's right. It's simply not interested in it. It's, it's just not our area. So. Unfortunately, for for civilian Australians and all around the world, um, you know, unless it's something that the government is really interested in, that's about the only time that it will go higher. So things like Westall and all the missing information in the Australian uh, government records, that that's what they're interested in. Then they they will come and have a look at it. But unless they're interested in it, they won't look at it. If there's any possibility of um, obtaining tech from a crash retrieval, for example, yeah, yeah. that sort of thing, they'll be all over it. And oh. there has been a um, years ago in Queensland, there was something that crashed and the military very quickly came in and uh, built something over the crash site. And then uh, they, I'm guessing they carefully picked it apart and then sent it off to the US. Um, now, I wasn't involved in that, but it was just before I came on the scene. But uh, Queensland researchers at the time had somehow been involved. Um, it was up north. I can't quite remember where, maybe near Townsville, but it was inland a bit. And um, I, look, even the people who knew about it have now passed on. So I couldn't even tell you anything about it, really. Yeah, yeah. But, but, so, but anything that happens like that in Australia goes straight to the US. What I've noticed um, in the reports that I've, or the cases that I've looked at historically, what will get uniforms out to a location is trace evidence. Mm. That's what will get them out. If it was in the sky and, and nothing, nothing landed, nothing happened, they'll only come and look if there's something to look at. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and um, who said, uh, James said, um, you know, what else can you do with anecdotal uh, reports anyway? You can't do a whole lot, you know, you just record it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so. and it all adds to the information and the data and all this sort of stuff that Elizondo wants to access. But you know, so my my case, I didn't report a UFO to the Space Force. I reported a Chinese satellite okay. because my light was blinking every thirteen seconds, and it went for fifteen minutes. What sits in the sky? They they they, they can't give me an answer, and. I, I'm open to anyone. I, I'm even willing to go to old mate. I can't remember his name. The idiot skeptic on Twitter. Um, Mick West, happy to send it to him. I just want an answer. What is it? Mm. So, yeah, the, with, with those cases, I've, I'm giving them data. Here's my location. I'm giving them a GPS location. I'm giving them an exact spot in the sky. I'm giving them that much data that they could utilize and run it through software and they have to know what's up there. They're flying that many things around in space. They have to know exactly where things are. Mm. That's <laughs> I'm just replying to Ruth who said, where do our records go if anywhere? 
Um, we hold hard copies of reports from the past. I think up to 1998 have still not been entered into any sort of database, but after that, the more, uh, the more not recent, but after that anyway, reports are entered into a database, um, which is on our website, which everyone can freely access. Um, but they haven't been kept up to date over the last five years either because over the years um, people have passed on or they have left and there are only a handful of us now who are running UFO Research Queensland. And uh, sometimes I don't know how we do what we actually do do, but we do. And um, and I think we're probably the last uh, UFO organisation that actually documents reports in Australia really. Um, unfortunately, with the social media, uh, and this I've had this conversation many times, is people do report things to, um, say, Facebook page, pages, but those pages are run by private people and those reports are not documented. So they all go astray. And I'm, I'm on most of the Australian UFO pages. I don't say anything, but um, and I watch it. And people, some people talk about some really interesting reports, but they don't report it to us. And once they say it, it's just gone, it's lost forever. So that's the way it is. Um, yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, it's, it's about having enough hands to do the work. That's, mm. you know, like I've got a, a heap of records here. I've got a lot of old, a lot of Victorian records from the 1990s, wanted to digitize them all, but. It's a boring, laborious process to do that, and nobody wants to do it. Yeah, yeah. Including me. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to do it either. I want to, I want someone else to do it. I'm not, I'm not pointing at Cheryl. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to do it either, but anyway, someone's got to do it. <laughs> and, I, and it doesn't get done. Um, in the, over the last few years, it hasn't been happening because of lack of people power. I was going to say to, to Ben that... Um, Someone in Australia who 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 would probably could at least give you an educate perhaps a an educated opinion. I don't know if you've heard of him. Is David Renecki? Um, yeah. He's he's an astronomer um, who was initially interested in UFOs. That was his initial interest, but he shied away from UFOs because of all the all the bullshit, and yeah. uh, basically decided that he would um, go into astronomy. And, and he's got a lot of a lot of. Um, a lot of knowledge and experience, and he's and he's always interested in UFO cases that have got facts and data. Yeah, right. Okay. And he, oh, I've got it all there: dates, times. Yeah, I have a so, GPS device on my camera, so yeah. So yeah. So he 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 may be able to give you some type of educated opinion on it. Yeah. Um, I've seen him in some of the page page groups where someone's posted a photo of a headlamp or something. And um, he's just gone. This is not. There's no information. There's no data. This is useless. Yeah. So, what, was, what was the name? Have you got contact details, or I just Google him? Or uh, his name's David Renecki. I'll give you. Uh, R e n e k e. Yeah, it's a bit of a funny spelling. Yeah. yeah. And right. he runs. He's 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 quite a well-known astronomer. Mm -hmm. Like he he yeah. really is. Uh, yeah, and he's, the guy he's, that's got it from the dish. He's uh, OAM. He's apparently the main man down there uh i've sent it to another lady who's at griffith university up here in queensland mm. uh i've sent it to ross Coulter, who's going to send it on to some guy in defense who he knows um i sent it to jay from project unity because he's meeting with uh john ramirez who was ex-cia and played with all of these things i just want someone to give me an answer that's all yeah. <laughs> well, what would happen if they don't or if they can't? It's just another UFO then, isn't it? Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Isn't, isn't that what we're that, – that's what we're all banging on about, isn't it? We're trying to find out what these UFOs are. Yeah. But we, we get to a point where you've just sort of got to go, well, it's just a light in the sky, isn't it? Yeah. But, but what sits in the sky for 15 minutes and flashes at you every 13 seconds. Yeah. Exactly. That's and that, that was over amazing. four nights, consecutive nights, four nights in the same spot in the sky, 13 minutes apart every night. I don't know. Did it move? Yeah. Yeah. And it was in Aquarius. Can I, can I, can I interrupt Aquarius. for a moment? Sorry? Can I interrupt for a moment? Yeah. 
Thank you. Ben, sorry, I just had to interrupt, mate. I feel your pain. That's all I wanted to say. <laughs> I have, This thing has been led me further down a rabbit hole than I ever knew existed. So I feel your pain, mate. Good luck. That's all. Thank you. My, my wife <laughs> despises this topic. <laughs> <laughs> we'll leave it at that. <laughs> Good. Yeah, let's leave that one. Yeah. It's it's not easy to be in that situation, but it does happen, unfortunately. Yeah. Does anyone else have anything else they'd like to say before we? I'm going to round it up here. Susie sent her apologies, and she said that um, she lost connection, thunder and lightning. Um, and she did say before she came on that um, they are having terrible weather over there storms in New Zealand where she is so she said so she might drop out so and she has so she says thank you and good night to everybody and uh and enjoy the evening have you seen the page Cheryl whose page the one that she's got that she wouldn't show us oh oh the report the um yeah. article yeah no, I have I that's the first I heard about it tonight she was, was having a little brief pre-chat before we came on but yeah, I um, I I I mean, I yeah, I haven't seen we're, it. We're not going to tell anyone, Cheryl. No, tell I haven't anyone. seen it. Honestly, I, <laughs> I, I, I haven't seen it. <laughs> I would tell you because I'm terrible at keeping secrets. <laughs> me too. <laughs> me too. If yeah. I can just interrupt again for a moment, Cheryl and Ben Hill, thank you very much for your time tonight, and to Susie, who I've enjoyed listening to. Our pleasure. But, um, thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much for your time. And Cheryl, yeah, I'd like to chat to you soon about this spot under my arm and my lost time. <laughs> yeah. I know I'd organise to have a chat with you tomorrow, but it's actually going to have to be Sunday if that works for you. Yeah, mate, no worries at all. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any time would be great. I'm not great. too concerned. I'm just interested. Okay. All right. Well, oh, sorry, Susan's just sent us another message. Maybe she's got something to tell everyone here. Hang on. Um. <laughs> so I do like to pass on her well wishes, etc. Oh no, smiley face, forget it. <laughs> okay, whoever invented these emojis, I don't know. Well, look, thank you, um, everyone, for coming, and thank you, Ben, for your time. No problem um, at all. So thanks, everyone, and um, until then, have a great month. <laughs>